This week we're in conversation with a new editor-in-chief of The Mail and Guardian and with South Africa still uh, fruming on a Tour de France cycling high, we're going to look at an astonishing tribute to mountain biker Barry Stunder, who died in a road accident earlier in the year. It really is where brand and empathy intersect. A very warm welcome to Mags on Media. Well, all of that is to come, but uh, first up, the company won its first can line in 1976, and it uh, really hasn't slowed down since then. This year, Coca-Cola not only won 20 lines, but was also named Creative Marketer of the Year at the annual festival in the south of France. Global Vice President of Advertising Strategy, Jonathan Mildenhall, jetted into Johannesburg earlier in the week to give a masterclass in integrated marketing communication to the local arm of the company. He also took some time out to talk to us about the brand's ongoing successes and challenges at a time when brands are constantly trying to articulate authenticity. Jonathan Mildenhall, Global Vice President, Advertising Strategy and Content Excellence. It's the last time I'm going to use that very long title. <laughs> a very warm welcome. You've just been named Creative Marketer of the Year at the Cannes Festival of Creativity. What is a creative marketer? But more importantly, uh, why is it important to the brand? A creative marketer, a creative marketing organization, is an organization that puts uh, creativity at the heart of its strategic development in terms of managing its brands and managing its company brand. And for the Coca-Cola company, we see creativity as an absolute competitive advantage. And that's not just something that we say, that is something that we do. And the best example of how we do it would be our organizational structure. We're one of the only multinational companies that has a discipline called creative excellence, which is a group of people, over 150 of us from all around the world, um, that come from the creative industries, either the music industry or the advertising industry or the media industry. And we're seen as the inflection point between the business of Coca-Cola and the creative industries. And we get the best out of the creative industries to drive the business of Coca-Cola for the benefit of our brand. Is this a philosophy that's got to permeate though through the entire organization? It's all very well to have you creative marketing lot sitting in one ivory tower, but surely this has got to apply to sales, it's got to apply to distribution, uh, and I don't want to use creative and finance together, but uh, you know the suits have got to be thinking along the same line, otherwise you're not going to get this right, are you? Absolutely. I mean, we are a big discipline and we are a big expense to the company. Um, uh, but the value of um, uh, creative excellence at the Coca-Cola company is it does impact the way that all facets of the Coca-Cola company engage with one another, be that design, be that HR, be that um, uh, uh, systems management. Um, we genuinely have become so much more embracing of creativity as a way to solve all sorts of problems, even internal organizational problems. Uh, creativity is a driver of the development. But of it's the a difficult discipline in any organization to manage and sustain, surely? It is. I wouldn't say that it isn't without its own tensions, its own conflicts, its own misunderstandings. Um, but this discipline is now 12 years old. We started to introduce creative excellence 12 years ago. And we've now got more people in more markets leading the creative drive than we've ever had before. And with this kind of philosophy in the organization, it puts more pressure, I would imagine, on your advertising agencies. It does. I always say that we're one of the best uh, clients that an agency could wish for, but we're also one of the toughest. We understand the agency games. We understand agency politics. We have a very, very strong creative point of view before we even brief an agency. And uh, to be honest, it's only agencies that have what I call creative stamina. You talked about it, it also influences the way in which you brief agencies. Does, does Coke do that differently? I um, uh, mandate all around our, our system uh, that we have biggest strategic thinking at the heart of our creative briefs. Uh, the Coca-Cola company creative briefs um, I hold up as being some of the most fertile creative briefs in um, uh, the marketing industry. And by fertile, I mean that once a creative group get exposed to our, our briefs, creative ideas literally just drip off them. I've never met an advertising agency 
that has said this is a great brief. They always complain about it. How do you do that brief differently? Well, we uh, spend an awful lot of time internally uh, developing the strategic story. So it's not just a strategic checklist. We turn our um, business mandates into a big and beautiful and well-articulated story. And at the heart of that story, there will be a big creative idea um, that we see as going to be an accelerator for the brand. And then we ask the agencies to translate that creative idea into a multi-platformed um, uh, communication space. Uh, and whether it's FIFA World Cup or whether it's Coca-Cola Christmas or whether it's Coke and Meals, at uh, the heart of all of those creative briefs is a big, beautiful space that inspires uh, creators all over the world. There's a common thread, I understand, that also runs through this whole process. This is what you say, the legacy we want to leave is of a brand and a company that does good things for the world. That's, that's very noble. Um, a lot of people could be very cynical about a statement like that. For us, it means being completely in touch with what is going on in the social context within which our brands uh, sit. We've been doing great creative work that has had an impact on social mores uh, for the last 60 years. We were the first advertiser to put black people in advertising in 1955, for example, in the US, when Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King had ignited the bus boycott. We have had a number of uh, cultural firsts, uh, the first advertiser to put um, ethnic people from all over the world uh, together when we did Hilltop. We've just recently done uh, India and Pakistan coming together to share a Coke um, via a vending machine uh, at a time when uh, the political parties uh, won't even speak to each other about the future of Kashmir. So Coca-Cola has always had um, a position in the world where it is prepared to have conversations, uncomfortable conversations, where um, political or social systems uh, tend to be broken. Most of the time, brands shy away from that. How do you mitigate against the kind of risk that that thinking creates? Coca-Cola is such a strong and powerful brand. It stands for um, happiness in the hearts and minds of consumers all over the world. And one of the drivers of happiness is the amazing things that happen when uh, people come together. I really believe that if we protect the notion of happiness and promote the notion of people coming together, there is no risk. But there's a risk of alienating people nonetheless. There's a risk of alienating a small minority, but the vast majority of people really, really do respect and celebrate it when Coca-Cola comes together and makes a social stand that is about inc uh, inclusion, uh, diversity, and harmony all over the world. But you must sit around the table and talk about this stuff. Oh my goodness. If you uh, take a look at Small World Machine, uh, the India-Pakistan vending machine. Which could have backfired. Great piece of work, but there was the potential to backfire. Which, for about 5% of the comments on YouTube, yeah. backfired horrifically. Um, but 95% of the comments on YouTube um, were incredibly positive. And when you take a look at those, me, Jonathan Noldenall, as head of advertising, leaning in to the comments on YouTube, the negative comments on YouTube, explaining why I think it's important that brands like Coca-Cola make a social stand. Let's address the final issue, and I've got to ask you this question. Um, you've just had an ad banned in the United Kingdom. Uh, essentially, just to, just to give the background, misleading consumers about how much activity they need to do in order to burn off 139 calories in a can of Coke. Did you get it wrong? I will be very honest with you, and I will say that this is the first time that Coca-Cola has led into this debate. Um, being, you know, actually at the center of this debate. And um, I believe that there is a huge opportunity for our work, our creative work in this space to be as inspirational and as authentic as the creative work around, say, something like the FIFA World Cup platform. But I don't want to get chastised for the very, very first conversation. Um, I believe our work can feel more inspirational, I believe our work can feel more authentic, and I believe our work can be more effective at getting people to really understand um, uh, some of the complicated issues around diet and around obesity and around health and, health and wellness. Given it's such a controversial issue, why do you need to go there? I think it's uh, very, very important that um, uh, the world 
uh, reverses the trend on obesity. I think it's very, very important that um, uh, teenagers particularly are inspired and are educated about health, well wellness and diet. Uh, and I think it's very, very important for all of us um, to um, be on a march towards a healthier human race. And given the Coca-Cola company's size and given our um, uh, creativity and given our community scale, uh, we have to, absolutely have to, uh, engage in this and provide proper solutions uh, for consumers all over the world. Well, you can tell us what you think of those global marketing observations on our Facebook page. And remember, the show also chirps all week on Twitter. Coming up on Mags on Media, the Mail and Guardian's new editor-in-chief and his challenges in an age of print and digital convergence. <laughs> Ence.com.